with that uh, we switch on to the third presentation of the day uh, this is the management of the common bile duct stricture so to talk about this complex pathology i'm sure this is something which we see on day to day basis patient has jaundice you get an ultrasound done that shows a cbd narrowing <laughs> which could be benign which could be benign could be malignant and could be related to the trauma after surgery so since this is a complex problem with availability of newer diagnostic modalities like mrcp ct scan spine glass cholangioscopy we do not know how much to go forward in a patient who may have a benign versus malignant disease to talk on this we have none other than professor nageshwar reddy who does not need any introduction and uh, he is the person who has taken the gastroenterology aculons to the moon for india and uh, the procession will be chaired by and uh, moderated by the flamboyant gastroenterologist from india dr t s chandrashekar may I hand over the proceeding to dr chandrashekar please you have to unmute yourself sir yeah at the outset i would like to thank dr anil arora for his excellent organizational audio the capacity is it my audio video uh, clear uh, anil yeah yeah it is all clear yes and i must congratulate at the outset for this excellent webinar program and your team and sir gangaram hospital we have a very common problem unlike what you saw the last uh, speaker telling about nicely about pancreatic cyst so this is the burning issue every day Whether it's indeterminate, is a brain or malignant. What else you will do for this? Whether you will operate or you stent him or you will wait for some time, and all these questions will be answered. We have an excellent speaker, Professor D. Nagesh Reddy. He does not need introduction to any audience, but his customary to just tell you that he has been the past president of World Endoscopic Organization, and he is the chairman and chief gastroenterologist of. the uh, the world largest gastroenterology institution we are very proud to have such institution in india and the uh, his synonym with the indian endoscope professor d nagesh reddy is going to talk on management of biliary stricture and after that uh, we have going to have a panel discussion on this so i welcome dr nagesh reddy to start is they proceeding nagi you are on ready thank you, you can shoot now thank you very much uh, yeah i think i'm on now i like to thank anil for giving this opportunity to talk on a topic which is very common in clinical practice and in recent uh, years we have developed an algorithm to approach these patients so what i'll do over the next 15 20 minutes is to try and give a very practical approach of what we do in these patients so when you're coming with a biliary stricture a patient comes to you usually with an image saying biliary stricture first thing you want to see is whether it's benign or malignant so how do you determine this and once you determine it's benign or malignant then you have to decide whether it has to go for endoscopic therapy or surgical therapy of course medical therapy has very little here and if it's endoscopic therapy are we going to do a palliative therapy curative therapy or increasingly now more new adjuvant therapies so all these questions have to be answered let me show you how we approach this patient so if you actually look at uh, malignant or look at biliary strictures in general i have this uh, diagram to make it very simple we look at proximal strictures and distal strictures now distal strictures are not much of a challenge so i put everything together proximal and distal proximal strictures malignant are usually cholangiocarcinoma gallbladder carcinoma in the north uh, whereas distal strictures are usually pancreatic cancers or ampullary cancers benign again proximal are mostly post surgical whereas distal is chronic pancreatitis so this clear division is very important for us to sort of keep in mind when you are approaching these patients now once we have this uh, division with us uh, the next uh, thing is that if you actually look at biliary strictures as a whole you are looking at two types the non psa related which are most common for us benign or malignant versus psa related now i just put this up because although primary sclerosing cholangitis is not very common with us we see this uh, uh, occasionally and then sometimes is very confusing what to do in this patient so let's go 
over first to clear out PSC from our uh, picture and then go further on. For PSC, of course, uh, is quite characteristic appearance on uh, cholangioscopy. Conventional cytology is not very good, but uh, we are now started doing fish, and when you add fish, of course, you get a high positivity, both in terms of sensitivity specificity. The treatment is often balloon dilatation. We do not do stenting, avoid stenting in these patients for this major extra pet crystal. So let's get PSC out of the picture and come to the actual problem that we face in clinical practice. These are non-PSC biliary strictures. The first thing is, are they malignant or benign? We have a variety of investigations to approach this. Uh, MRCP is a patient usually comes to us to the gastroenterologist with an MRCP picture. Uh, sometimes good CT scans like this, which actually tell us that there's a hyla lesion here with separation of ducts. And of course, an endoscopic ultrasound, which is wanted tissue resections. Now, even after all this, you'll realize that in many patients, especially for proximal strictures, we still don't have a diagnosis as malignant or benign. For example, look at this. If I show you these three x-rays and ask you uh, which is malignant, which is benign, which is inflammatory, I'm sure uh, it wouldn't be very easy to say that. Uh, but actually, if you look at it, this was uh, post-operative strictures. The clips are obvious, malignant and inflammatory. Very difficult to distinguish. So this is one of the biggest challenges now in clinical practice for us is this indeterminate bilayer stricture. So I'll spend a little time on how we are now making this much more easy to diagnose. The major problem here is the tissue. Tissue is the issue because uh, strictures may look very similar, but this is a cholangiocarcinoma. This is tuberculosis. Still, we continue to see these cases could be inflammatory, post-operative, and so on. So the tissue is the main issue here. So in distal biliary strictures, the problem is simplified to a certain extent. An endoscopic ultrasound with FNA, to a very large extent, now up to 80% of the cases, we can get a diagnosis. This is not a problem. Uh, so it's more the proximal strictures is a problem. And in these cases, uh, very often, we started using cholangioscopy in these patients to try and differentiate benign and malignant. And if you see an obvious picture like this, this is a cholangiocarcinoma, which is very obvious. So use of uh, this cholangioscope has made it very easy for us. Uh, I'll show you a very dramatic um, uh, experience here of how we can differentiate it. We get two strictures here, the high CBD, mid CBD, both of them look like cholangiocarcinoma. All other investigations were normal. And when we did a cholangioscope, we just look at these very interesting pictures. In the left side, this was a uh, high CBD stricture, and you can see a polypoidal lesion here. We took biopsies from this. On the right side, you see a bulge, but you can see caseous material coming out here. And then, of course, you know, it's tuberculosis that's causing this. Biopsies were taken from both, and you can see this was a B-cell lymphoma, which was treated uh, with uh, radiation and chemotherapy, and this was uh, tuberculosis. So both conditions which are gone for surgery, are gone for surgery both treated very adequately. So I think this is the power of cholangioscopy in differentiating this between benign. And this was uh, uh, a pool's the systematic research that uh, was published by Navanathan. And you can see very clearly that uh, cholangioscopy has a very high sensitivity and specificity in patients who have uh, indeterminate bilay strictures. Now, but there is an important thing here to realize that when do you say it's indeterminate bilay strictures? You say indeterminate bilay strictures now, when you do an ERCP, do brushings and cytology, and this is negative, and this is indeterminate, but the concept has changed now. Indeterminate biliary strictures are now termed as indeterminate just at imaging itself. So you have an MRCP, you have an endoscopic ultrasound or a good CT scan, you cannot differentiate to say whether it's malignant or benign, then we call them uh, indeterminate biliary strictures. So what should we do in these patients? So we actually did this study to, to see what <laughs> we can do in these patients. This was a multicentric study with a German and a Hong Kong group. We took 60 patients who on imaging were indeterminate. And then in this patient, they divided into two groups. One group, an ERCP brushing was done, 29. Another group, directly we went for cholangioscopy. We didn't do ERCP brushing. We went directly for a cholangioscopy and cholangioscopic biopsies. And look at this. The overall sensitivity and accuracy is much higher even in a group when you primarily do cholangioscopy and biopsy, 95%. So therefore, this study very clearly showed that in patient who comes with the indeterminate biliary strictures on imaging, if you, instead of doing multiple ERCPs, if you do a direct cholangioscopy, you would almost 90% uh, of chances get a diagnosis. But there's a problem here in our country. Although this is very good for Western countries, in our country, 
the cost of cholangioscopy is going to be extremely high. So wherever the ERCP cost is low and cholangioscopy cost is high, this algorithm may not be accurately applicable. But if a patient can afford it, what we suggest is that if we get a patient with indeterminate biliary structure, instead of uh, doing a ERCP brushing, biopsy, so on, and waiting, we do a cholangioscopy. And we, now we do on-the-spot cholangioscopy biopsy evaluation, so-called ROSE technique. And we have the diagnosis on table so that what you want to do further can be decided at the same ERCP in these patients. So this is one important advance that has occurred recently. Another very important advance that has occurred, and this is very interesting, this is a, uh, a concept that came in gastroenterology two years back, but somehow was missed by most gastroenterologists. We know that malignant uh, tissue actually secretes a large, large amount of extracellular tissue, extracellular vesicles. These extracellular vesicles are larger in size, more in number in patients who have malignancy. Now, using this, a group from uh, Switzerland actually published a study sometime back in gastroenterology, where they showed that to differentiate between malignant versus benign biliary structures, all you have to do is take bile from these patients, either putting a nasobiliary tube or a catheter, and then there's, this, there's a machine, a very simple machine called a nanometer, which you just feed this bile inside, and immediately you can know the amount and the size of the extra cellular vesicle. And uh, if they are, you can actually very high accuracy to differentiate between benign and malignant. And this was uh, what we published recently, where we looked at uh, these extracellular vesicles with a cutoff point uh, uh, to differentiate between benign and malignant. It was 100% sensitive, a very high accuracy of sensitivity and specificity. Not only this, but when you combine it with volatile organic compounds in the bile, so the bile which we take are then subjected to mass spectroscopy with gas chromatography, and then we can actually, again, with an extremely high value, even in this study was 100% cut off by nowism, we can differentiate malignant from benign structures. And this, again, has been our experience, which we published recently, where we looked at dichlorobenzene in the bile in patients to differentiate between benign and malignant. And you can see very clearly that the extremely high sensitivity and specificity uh, in differentiating benign from malignant. I think these two technologies, cholangioscopy and using uh, bile for extracellular vesicles and uh, uh, these are volatile uh, compounds can give us a very clear differentiation. So we're now reaching uh, a rate of about 90 to 95 percent differentiating benign from malignant. And this um, vexed question of 30 to 40 percent of patients with benign going for unnecessary surgeries is no longer there. Okay, so now we have got a patient in whom you have diagnosed malignant biliary structure. What do you do? Of course, we know that the, the best hope or cure for this patient is surgery with an R0 resection. Unfortunately, 80 percent of the patients who come to us cannot undergo surgery because of uh, advanced stage they come. So stenting is what is done as a palliation for most of these patients. So this was the question, what you should do, whether we should do a plastic stent or whether we should do a metal stent. And it used to be thought that for patients who had a short lifespan of more than three months, you should put in plastic stents. For those with longer lifespan, we put in a metal stent. But this concept has changed now. And this was a Dutch study which actually looked at all patients, those with uh, even end-stage carcinomas to see whether you can, you can differentiate whether you put a plastic stent or a metal stent. And from this, it's very clear that in all patients, irrespective of whatever stage of malignancy, SEMS may be the best option. Now, if you have a patient who is extremely advanced, has a month or two to live, then of course, you don't want to waste your money. But in general, for most patients, uh, we have found that uh, SEMS is superior to plastic stents, especially the cost of SEMS is coming down. Okay, so we now go into the actual management of patients with malignant strictures in the proximal region, the so-called patients mainly with cholangiocarcinoma or carcinoma of the gallbladder. So what do you do in these patients? Now, this is, for the ERCP, it's the most challenging area because you have to determine several things. And let me come to these things. That is, what we should know. We should know the bismuth classification is type 1, type 2, type 3, or type 4. Extremely important. And, and most often on MRCP, we know this. We should know whether one of the lobe is atrophic because draining this lobe is not going to be useful. Of course, we look at the vascular involvement because that makes a difference for surgery, any abnormal anatomy. So before we actually approach these patients, these four important questions have to be looked at. Uh, in all our patients with proximal biliary strictures, it's almost always a must to do an MRCP. Without an MRCP, we would not do an 
ERCP in these patients. Because this French study very clearly showed that for effective drainage, you have to drain at least 50% of the liver. Now, how do you know 50% of the liver? Of course, based on MRCP and atrophy of the lobe, you can actually calculate whether you're draining 50% of the liver. So uh, this is therefore very important. So once you decide that you know how much liver to drain, what stent should you use? Should you use plastic stent or metal stent for proximal obstruction? I think here, it's again very clear from several studies that uh, metal stents are superior to plastic stents. There are many, many studies, but this is a classic one from Japan. Uh, where they compared SEMS with plastic stents uh, in patients with uh, proximal malignant obstruction. It's clear that uh, whether it's cholangiocarcinoma, whether it's nodes, or whether it's gallbladder carcinoma, metal stents are superior to plastic stents. So all these patients, we use uncovered metal stents, uh, but plastic stents occasionally we use in a preoperative setting, the neoadjuvant setting, when the diagnosis is not uh, sure. These are the two very rare situations. Otherwise, mostly it's metal stents. Now, how many stents should we use? This is, again, a very common question asked. Uh, and this is something which is very important and practical because if you have a patient, you have to drain 50% of the liver, how many stents should you use? Should you use two stents, three stents, one stents, and so on? Now, this was uh, a very important paper that came from Korea, which actually looked at patients having clad skin tumor, predominantly type 2, type 3, and type 4. And when they found, what they found was in these patients when they compared bilateral stenting versus unilateral stenting, they found that bilateral stenting was better because there was less stent occlusion, less reintervention. Although survival didn't differ too much, bilateral stenting was definitely superior to unilateral stenting, especially if you have clad skin 3B and clad skin 4, I think it's better to do a bilateral stenting. So, but again, how many stents, which stents? So I've simplified this from several studies in literature, very easy to remember. If you have a patient with bismuth 1 or bismuth 2, a single stent is enough. Uh, for bismuth 2, a single stent predominantly in the right side because 50% of the liver is damaged. If you have uh, bismuth 3A, again, you put double stent, sometimes three stents, one in left side and two in the right side because separation occurs between right and left lobe. In bismuth 3B, again, single stent is enough because uh, the total left side is cut off. Very often it's atrophic. In bismuth 4, you have to put two stents, usually on the same side, on the right side. So very easy to remember. Bismuth 1, bismuth 2, and bismuth 3B, we use a single stent. Whereas in bismuth 3A or bismuth 4, we use two stents. So this is a very easy formula to remember, especially for the undergraduate, for the postgraduates. And which technique should we use? We know that there are two techniques, one side-by-side -side and one stent-in-stent -stent technique. And uh, you can see that uh, of these two techniques, uh, I prefer side-by-side, -side, although many Korean and Japanese endoscopists still do stent-in-stent -stent techniques, but this doesn't make too much difference. But generally to summarize, if you have a patient with type 1 endoscopy, type 2 endoscopy, type 3 also endoscopy. In type 4 patients, increasingly now, we are taking the help of our interventional radiologists to actually tackle these uh, cases because uh, type 4, you don't use too much of waste of time for endoscopies to try and selectively cannulate and put in multiple stents. So better to give it off to our interventional radiologist. There's another concept here that we can't reach the ampulla for any region in patients who have biliary strictures, proximal or distal. Then of course you can use endoscopic drainage, ultrasound drainage, either transgastric or uh, transduodenal to drain these patients. This is very established. But what is not well established and what is controversial, what is emerging in the literature is should we be doing US drainage as a primary drainage? Not because ERCP has failed. You can do an ERCP in these patients, but that some endoscopic ultrasonologists are getting confident in saying, why do ERCP at all? Why not we do US? And uh, two studies, one from uh, Sham Vardarajulu's group, published uh, two years back, showed that US was superior, less pancreatitis. Similarly, another study from uh, Korea, South Korea showed similar features. But I believe we still aren't gone to the stage. I think we still, this is not time to think of primary US drainage for, for uh, draining biliary strictures. We still have to do ERC provides. In addition to draining these patients, now increasingly, we're improving the palliation. How do you improve palliation? Improve, uh, improve survival, increase stent patency, and improve quality of life. And for that, we're doing local tumor ablation. Nowadays, in all our patients, and most centers of 
over the world, local tumor ablation is being added to stenting to increase the lifespan and also to increase the quality of life. We reported this long back, uh, about eight years back, where we started doing radiofrequency ablation in these patients to open up these malignant strictures following stenting. And the first randomized study came from uh, China in 2018, where they showed very clearly that patients who had stent and RFA had a much longer stent patency, much longer survival compared to those who had only a stent. Uh, subsequently, we have had another study from China which showed that if you do RFA stent plus chemotherapy, you can increase the survival and stent patency in this group. So now it's become fairly common with evidence which is significant that these patients with uh, biliary strictures, in addition to, if you want to just palliate them with stenting, you must add a radio frequency ablation to these patients. So, let, so we are done with uh, these now. Most distal strictures, of course, are treated malignant with surgery. Let's come to benign briefly. So benign, you have post-surgical, which are mostly proximal, and uh, distal ones are mostly chronic pancreatitis, and the treatment is different here. For post-surgical or proximal strictures, we do the aggressive approach of Guido Costa Magna using multiple stents for a stricture like this, less than one centimeter post-operative. We put in multiple stents and after 12 months, remove these stents and it's very good results. So this should be the standard of care. For patients with distal strictures, especially due to chronic pancreatitis, we believe that we should change our practice from multiple plastic stents to a completely covered metal stent. As you showed in the study long back, you can see that 80% um, of the patients after uh, 12 months and after three years are also continuing to have patency of the lumen when you use this. And especially we recently published this long-term study of uh, more than five years. And some of these patients have been followed up to seven, eight years. You can find that in 60% of the patients, we still have uh, a patency of the lumen after removing the stent, metal stent, which has been put for 12 months. And uh, if you have a pancreatic benign biliary structure due to chronic pancreatitis, less than three centimeters in size with absence of calcification in the pancreas or a head mass, then in these patients are ideal for putting in this completely covered stem, but you must put it for 12 months, remove it and majority of the patients can be treated very well with this. Anyway, treatment of the biliary stricture in spite of what all I have said, I think is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, all our patients with the biliary strictures go for a multidisciplinary conference. You have a gastroenterologist, interventional radiologist, surgeon, and oncologist, all coming together and you'll see that uh, all of them have a role in these patients to give our patients the best care. And to summarize, all biliary strictures, you must have a surgical consult or a multidisciplinary meet to decide what to do. In patients with indeterminate biliary strictures, we are now more often doing, uh, uh, more often doing a cholangioscopy to get the diagnosis. Distal strictures, the US can give, but I think I'd bring your attention to the recent concept of extracellular vesicles are using uh, uh, volatile organic acids uh, uh, to differentiate between benign and malignant strictures. For malignant strictures, uh, especially for palliation, we use uh, self-expanding metal stents, uncovered stents for proximal tumors, along with uh, adjuvant therapy with radiofrequency ablation. For benign strictures, for distal, we use uh, completely covered self-expanding metal stents, and for proximal, we use uh, multiple plastic stents. So using this algorithm approach, majority of the patients with uh, biliary strictures can be treated very addict to adequately on an evidence-based manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nagi, for your wonderful presentation. This time I really enjoyed it because of your pictorial representation. I must congratulate you for the two uh, new publication you had in GI endoscopy. One is on spyglass is better than the uh, ERCB brush cytology. I must congratulate for that. I think we have uh, the panelists lined up and you have given a overall view of the, the uh, biliary strictures, both uh, malignant and benign strictures. And I was told by Dr. Anil, there are a lot of community gastroenterologists and postgraduates are attending. For their benefit, I thought, we will take a five issues with the other panelists. Let me start with you, Nagi. The concern about cholangitis in proximal biliary structure when you do spyglass. What is your take on this and how do you prevent it? Yeah, so this is a very important question. Again, I didn't want to go to too much details of the procedure, but uh, in any proximal structures, 
with or without cholangioscopy, the incidence of cholangitis is extremely high. So there are certain precautions. Whenever we do in these cases, we put in a guide wire into all the segments to see that we can enter later on if we want to. And uh, so that suppose the main cause of cholangitis is of course undrained segments which, uh, which can give rise to this problem. So we have to see that after the cholangioscopy is over, all these segments are drained so that cholangitis is not there. In spite of that, 10 to 15 percent of the patients develop cholangitis, which may require either a re-intervention or, of course, a percutaneous approach. All these patients are covered with antibiotics before the procedure, so that uh, that is always before cholangioscopy. And the other common trick is that when you're doing cholangioscopy, we try and inflate, we try and put in very little saline as possible. The common tendency is to Push, uh, push a button which a lot of fluid flows into that, it distends the bile to get give good views, but this is not uh, correct. You don't require good views, you require adequate views, adequate to make a diagnosis. And if you follow this principle of not putting in too much saline, uh, very often uh, you can avoid the cholangitis in these patients. So, no less saline, and you still do it. As the best way to avoid cholangitis. Okay, and we have a learned panelist, Dr. Uh, Professor S. S. Sarma, Dr. Sandeep Mijawan, and our uh, the uh, Barun Sastava and Dr. Omid and Dr. Munir Sastava. Uh, I have a question. I think Nagi has summarized it very well. But you will always in dilemma when you get a uh, biliary stricture, apart from being benign and uh, malignant. Which one will be appropriate imaging while evaluating biliary stricture? Uh, you will be tempted to do CT scan, MRI, PET scan, UES, which one you will choose as per the case or what is your protocol? Uh, uh, Professor S.S. Sarma, you are there? Yes, yes, sir. And he is a leading gastroenterologist from Rajasthan and northern part of India. Dr. Sarma? Thank you, thank you. Uh, once we have seen the level of obstruction on abdominal ultrasound, the next step will be to do either a CT scan or MR with MRCP. Both of these investigations are of equal importance and some people prefer that for distal lesions, CT scan is better, for proximal lesion, MR is better. But there is no difference. You can choose any of these investigations. Once on CT scan or MR, we see there are the characteristic features of a malignant structure or if we see a mass lesion, then the next, inve next investigation will be US guided FNA. But depending upon the lesion, the lower, uh, if lesion is in the pancreas or lower CBD, uh, USFNA can be done. Once the lesion is in the hilum and the lesion is resectable or patient is supposed to undergo transplant, in that situation, we do not suggest FNA of that lesion, USFNA of that lesion. A PET scan, as far as PET is concerned, uh, it is uh, uh, uncommonly used, but it can sometimes diagnose the lesion which are not seen on CT scan or MRI, small lesions which are avid for glucose because there's a high glucose uptake uh, and uh, uh, decreased excretion of the glucose. So one can pick up the lesions, uh, sometimes hilar cholangiocarcinoma or especially the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and small pancreatic lesions which are not picked up on routine investigations. Endoscopic ultrasound, uh, once, if we don't uh, diagnose by all of these lesions, then ERCB guided uh, methods like cytology, uh, biopsy, fish. No, no, we are not going to the tissue diagnosis. First, imaging, I think you have nicely summarized. I think most of the images are imaging techniques are complementary to each other. Yes. So you cannot be with one. Uh, if you are lucky, then you'll be all right. And uh, I think you made it very clear. PET scan is only want to know the extent of the lesion. U.S. if you want to take biopsy, and if it is a lower CBD structure, the CT scan, the proximal, you want to go for MRCP. Is it all right? This is what. And uh, I just take you to the some literature re review. The sensitivity of detection of obstruction is good with the ultrasound, CT, and MRI. That's what you said. And you want to know the benign versus malignant. You are more uh, to, it is CT will be better than the MRI and the ultrasound. But if you want to know the extent of the stricture, as you said rightly, the MRCP would be a better choice of investigation. Uh, this is uh, from Radiology 2018. Suppose if you have a case like this, you see the MRCP, and uh, as you rightly put it, you do a UES because there was an extraneous impression over the CBD, and uh, we do the uh, FNA like this, and uh, so FNA would be a preference. As you said, you want to take a FNA C. 
and this turned out to be histopathology is malignant neoplasm. So this is what it is you said. And now the, as you said clearly, the imaging, multimodality imaging you need and it is complement to, to each other. So next issue is, as I nicely put it, tissue is the issue in cholangiocarcinoma. So I have another panelist, Dr. Muni Sachdeva. He works in the Gangaram Hospital, I was told. Uh, which is your best choice and what is your practical approach? Nagi has told so many the advances happening. I really like that extracellular vesicle you were telling about once in the ACG meeting also, and the fish technique and the spyglass technique. So Dr. Muni, what is your take? When you will do ERC breast cytology, spyglass cholangioscopy or US guided or CT guided biopsy. What is your take, Dr. Muniz? Is Dr. Muniz around? Am I audible? Yeah, Dr. Shansaka, you are. Yeah, Dr. Muniz? Hi, how first are you? All, yeah. yeah. Basically, first of all, I should con congratulate uh, Dr. Eddy for his nice and perfect talk. I think he has given all everything about the stitches, I should not uh, revise that. You know, if you have uh, ERCP, cholangioscopy, spyglass, and uh, US, so most of the centers, they don't have uh, cholangioscopy and US. I think in that scenario, when you have a high suspicion, hello? Yeah. When you have a high suspicion of cholangiocarcinoma, especially when you don't have any local lymph node or a distant lymph node, you don't have any liver lesion or a lung lesion. In that scenario, the tissue becomes very, very important in present era of evidence as well as medical legal era. So you have to have a diagnosis. And that diagnosis should be a tissue diagnosis rather than empirically subjecting any patients to treatment sub, uh, suspecting tubercular or a cholangiocarcinoma. So as uh, Dr. Reddy rightly said, in patients who have got uh, lower end uh, stricture, the US has a US with F and B has a very high sensitivity of reaching up to 80%. While in patients with mid or uh, upper stricture, isolated stricture, there is no evidence of any local lymph node or uh, uh, you know, any other lesion behind then doing a cholangioscopy and biopsy. And I would add on something like, you know, if you have on-site assessment of biopsy with fish. Or other uh, genetical. Uh, you do uh, fish, Dr. Manish. Do you do fish in your hospital? Yeah, sir. But issue is they are doing only on tissue. They don't give us. No, no. Are uh, you the fish called a fish in your hospital? Yeah. Am I audible? Hi. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Chandrasekhar, we don't have fish as yet. I think there is something wrong with the connectivity with Munish. You can carry on. Okay, right. I think uh, the Nagi has nicely pointed out. But I just want to take you a small literature review here. Brushing alone the sensitivity. See, most of them are highly specific. There's no doubt about that. Brushing alone, 45%. Uh, biopsy alone, 48%. But combination of brushing and biopsy goes up to the another 10 more percent added. So the combination, we have to do that. The other thing, very important thing is if we add fish technique, there is a very important statement, all these three, brush and the, and if you take brush and uh, the cytology, uh, that is biopsy and fish technique, the sensitivity improves to the tune of 80%. That is a very important thing. You see the sensitivity of 82% and specificity. That's the reason why Nagi was emphasizing on fish technique. I think this is a, how difficult to establish this fish technique, Nagi. Uh, yes, so, yes, so we have started doing fish now for uh, last two years. Uh, what we found is fish is very easy. It's not all difficult to establish. It's just that you have to have a certain volume of cases. The pathologists uh, do this very easily. But fishing so is only, difficult, no? <laughs> so fishing of this fishing, this type of fish of that is small area is very difficult, no, Nagi? No, it's uh, the the only problem is that we what we have found is that specifically fish is useful in the setting of PSC. So if you have a suspected cholangiocarcinoma in PSC, fish is useful. But for regular cholangiocarcinoma, fish is not uh, something that we would be advocating it. And therefore, very small indications. And unless you have volumes, this may not be the right thing to do. The but the cost of establishment, I mean. so, 
fish is uh, no you do not cost is not so much because we are using the same technologies in other areas also the tests in our hospital cost about 2000 rupees the fish you accept uh, people referring cases for this yes yes, yes 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 okay right i think that so is a the, important the, point the only thing again, i want to emphasize is fish is mainly uh, for for setting of psc plus cholangiocarcinoma versus uh benign structure in psc that's the place where fish is as actually the group in mayo started using it to first for this and then that's where it's going to be mainly useful not for regular cholangiocarcinoma it will be very useful in uh, benign or psc plus or minus cholangiocarcinoma yes, i think exactly. that is the take home message now and this is a very important thing how long you can repeat ercp biopsy you don't need to repeat it if you perform one if it is negative and you go for this a very nice study and you go for the uh, spyglass cholangio i mean uh, cholangioscopy and guided biliary ductal biopsy this is a very important thing i just want to drive home and uh, yes i think uh, one important message also we should send out to audience is that never to use ercp only as a diagnostic modality ercp is a very dangerous technique uh, especially in those with hilar cholangiocarcinoma the incidence of post ercp pancreatitis and infections are extremely high so one is of course one should be sensitized to that and if you're doing an ercp you should also end up as a therapeutic procedure that is just do a diagnostic without putting a stent is going to be terrible so i think ercp should be approached with a certain respect both to the patient and to the instrument i think and the instrument you should never do a diagnostic procedure should be combined yes. with the stenting in case in an indeterminate uh, structure if the biopsy is negative or brush is negative i think next approach will be the spyglass this is what it is so this patient uh, comes with this uh, the mrcp picture like this it is acute cholecystitis is also this patient had so they had given it as mrgi syndrome and cbd structure and this is the uh, colon uh, this is a spyglass straight away went for the spyglass because of the uh, this the structure was whether it is a benign or malignant we are not able to decide and a spyglass showed uh, this is the picture and uh, so what is the panel is thinking it's a benign structure or malignant N nagi had reported naked eye appearance also uh, very useful so what is your take other panel is then i'll ask nagi what is this uh, the yeah it looked malignant actually because of the uh, the vascular pattern was uh, abnormal and there was a projection of the tissue also so it looked like malignant so the mrcp was very deceptive sandeep uh, nizam you are very right and this is uh, in fact what happened is we did the pet ct also it is extreme i mean widespread uh, uh, the spread of the tumor and it turned out to be then we had to settle with it and biopsy was uh, uh, suggestive of malignant malignancy and uh, same note i just want to ask uh, sandeep this is a mrc picture of one patient how it looks like and uh, very important another small thing but very important is you must look at the papilla very well sometimes lower cbd structure papilla gives you a lot of information apart from ampullary growth so what is your take other panelists i would like to ask uh, dr amit dr barun and the sandeep sandeep is there and dr sharma ji uh, papilla looks a bit abnormal actually no yeah, this is definitely it's abnormal it's okay infiltrated infiltrated yes. also infiltrated okay and uh, any guess from other panelist i think i see bile coming out from one small bile is small amount of bile i think nagi had a extraordinary eye so this is bile is also coming out this is abnormal papilla so what is the guess lower cervical stone uh, <laughs> thank oh stone that is also very good uh, stone uh, it's like a pregnant ampulla no carcinoid They about to develop carcinoid vivek you are there good hi hi uh, hi vivek uh, this is a carcinoid one possibility impacted stone to second possibility third is nagi is telling small amount of bile is coming out this is maybe uh, yes. huh? i think some fistula formation is there fistula formation also there okay we decided to take a biopsy and biopsy there was some bleeding but so we cut open Uh, we did a, uh, then we took the biopsy and the biopsy some bleeding was there then we the bleeding got controlled with the the adrenal injection and this one and this is the report has come now 
immunohistochemistry had to be done. Most of them are plasma cells positive for IgG4, even though it is little uncommon, very uncommon, maybe rare, consistent IgG4 related. And we reported uh, the, this case report. And it turned out to be after starting steroid, there is a disappearance of the stricture. Once in a way, you also come across the point here to be learned. You look at the papilla very well in a lower CBD stricture. This is a take home message. I just wanted to tell you here. Uh, we have Dr. Umit from Nepal. Nagi has told very clearly about. Dr. Umit, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And okay. Umit, how is Nepal? Yeah, it's going on as usual. Okay, right. But Nagi has told very clearly it. about uh, the benign stricture. Uh, proximal, we go for a multiple plastic strand. Lower end, we'll go for the covered metallic strand nicely as that. I just want to ask you, there is a time when you need to know about, because this audience, we need to know about this. When do you refer the patient for surgery in brain bleary stricture? Yes, this is very important because uh, as all of us know that uh, endoscopic therapy is, of course, the first line treatment for the patient with the benign biliary stricture. But there are certain situations where we need, we need to refer the patients for the surgery, even in the benign biliary stricture. So particularly if the patient is non-compliant to endoscopic therapy, there is no option. We have to send the patient for the surgery. But also in the patient with the um, failure to endoscopic therapy, maybe because of the difficult biliary strictures, then we may have to refer the patient to the surgery. And of course, there is a uh, situation when the endoscopic therapy may be refractory to the benign biliary strictures. Uh, okay. Such kind of the things may happen in some of the situations such as chronic pancreatitis, uh, particularly associated with the uh, calcific pancreatitis involving the head of the pancreas. So if the benign biliary stricture is associated in such kind of the chronic pancreatitis with the pancreatic head calcification, then the uh, endoscopic therapy may tend to be refractory in such cases. So uh, there's, there was one study uh, published in the endosco surgical endoscopy which uh, has shown that surgical treatment may provide better long-term outcome for the patients in persisting uh, chronic pancreatitis isolated biliary stricture even after the more than three times uh, endoscopic procedures. So the study has shown that the chronic pancreatitis associated biliary stricture, particularly associated with the pancreatic hair calcifications, may be refractory to endoscopic treatment. So in so selected the patients- the Refractory biliary stricture, particularly associated with chronic pancreatitis is the take. Now we have three panelists there, uh, yes, endoscopy, Dr. Nagi and Dr. Sarma and Dr. Sandeep. What is your take on when do you take them for surgery? Nagi, in your unit, uh, how, how often you refer them for uh, surgery in benign biliary stricture? Benign biliary stricture is quite uh, easy. Again, proximal and distal. In distal strictures are usually secondary to chronic pancreatitis. If the size of the stricture is more than 10, 10, 3 centimeters, if the stricture is uh, associated with the head mass and calcification, these patients better go for surgery, not for endoscopic uh, therapy. Now for proximal strictures, uh, usually secondary to post cholecystectomy, uh, sometimes of course liver transplant, but post cholecystectomy strictures, uh, refractory to therapy, not compliant to therapy, or difficult to do endoscopic therapy, three indications at once. Or if you want to directly send them for surgery without even endoscopic uh, therapy, is that if the size is more than one centimeter, length is more than one centimeter, or if the complex strictures involving both the right and left hepatic tract which are usually ischemic strictures and don't respond to endoscopic therapy. So they're very clear cut indications when we send our patients for surgery. So in such cases, you never even attempt uh, endotherapy? Yes. No, I don't think we should. If it's a complex stricture, ischemic strictures, we should not because it's going to fail. And what we have found is that for surgeon, it's much easier to operate on a naive uh, native uh, bile ducts rather than to go and operate on infected bile ducts after repeated stenting. So they don't like it. So therefore, when we, again, we have a multidisciplinary meeting and for example, when GV is sitting and says, okay, this goes for surgery, the patient directly goes for surgery. We don't have to uh, go through endos. I think this is a concept of failed repeated endoscopy going for surgery is not right. We have to decide in the beginning itself, which patients are more likely to benefit because when they're not infected, they do very well post-surgically. But if it's infected, surgical problems post-operative are many. 
I think I like to a uh, summary slide that firstly he said all the uh, biliary structure you need to have a discussion with the surgeon first. That's a very good statement. Number one, number two is you choose the case right from beginning. Those who really need to undergo surgery, you refer them to surgery instead of now uh, keeping on and keep on doing the uh, endotherapy. That's very good. Now we have Dr. Barun Sresta. I just want to ask you, uh, Nagi has really outlined it very well in cholangia carcinoma inoperable. Do you see any time operable? Because we see aggressive surgeons here. And where do you, how do you assess the inoperability, operability? And uh, uh, do you practice double stent? And the, uh, in uh, type 4, you always go for PTBD or you try ERCP? These are the questions I would like to ask uh, uh, so that uh, we will learn more from our panelists. And uh, Nagi, you can also highlight after Varun says the uh, Sresta. Dr. Varun Sresta is there. Dr. Barun is from Nepal. Dr. Barun, are you there? I think maybe he's not connected. Okay, he's, uh, I just saw him, but I, uh, there is some connectivity. Uh, the, uh, As he's uh, coming uh, along, this question of type 4, uh, what we should do, endoscopy or PTPD. 20 years back, I would uh, do endoscopy in this place. Go on trying, putting different wires, get some kick out of it, trying to drain. But uh, after a lot of wisdom that has come in, I realized that we should not do. In fact, if I see a type 4, I first ask a radiology colleague, do you think you can tackle it? So if you can, then I'll give it up to him first. I won't even do endoscopy and contaminate this patient. So I would suggest strongly that if you have a type. Okay, Nagi, I have a small uh, radiological uh, uh, Because uh, the reason is for radiologists, it's very easy to access different ducts. It's very short route. They can put in multiple... Uh, uh, stents very easily compared to what endoscope is done. So it's better if you have a good interventional radiologist type 4, do not try endoscopic approaches. If contaminate and pass problems, go for radiological approach. Now I have a small question uh, to clarify here. In endoscopy, we don't inject contrast. We selectively, yes. the guide where it goes only, we put a stent. Yes. Suppose you have a type 4 block, a right anterior duct and right posterior duct is blocked. Okay. Now, my guide wear goes very nicely to anterior duct, doesn't go to the posterior duct. I don't contaminate the posterior ductal system. I straight away go there. Now, in the uh, PTBD, they inject a contrast. Sometimes it triggers state into the posterior duct also. So, there is a chance of uh, infecting the uh, other system also, wherein he's not able to put the stent. That is a concern. So what do you, what is your take? Yeah. Now I take in this first is that uh, when we think we are selectively going to drug injecting contrast, you don't see contrast other duct. Uh, this does not mean that you're not contaminating other duct. You are contaminating because some small amount of microscopic uh, uh, connections will be there between the drug. So you contaminate the drug. Now we see it on uh, X-ray and think, okay, we injected only here. Let us drain. We'll drain. But the patient will come back with colon. That is that's the reason. The reason is because there is some amount of minor communication with the contrast is not seen. Whereas the radiologists, when they inject, they immediately see the communication and they drain all the segments. So that's the reason why radiology, IR is superior to endoscopy in draining these patients. Somebody has asked about air cholangiogram. I personally, of course, air cholangiogram has been described to decrease cholangitis, but I personally would not be doing that because of the problem of air embolism. There are reports yeah. of uh, air embolism occur. So be careful because somebody was suggesting, can we do air air cholangiogram, I think it to be very careful uh, that you should not. We have tried carbon dioxide uh, uh, cholangiograms, which are a little safer, but not so easy to do. So therefore, we still depend on the conventional techniques, but always have a guide wire in, in the indented duct. And you were slight telling about single stent, double stent, all yeah. this thing. I think uh, it is very clear about we no need to go into that double stent. 50%. There is always some difficulty in assessing 50% of the volume of the liver. So, which so is the technique? No. If you have a combination of, say, MR, MRCP along with the cross-sectional imaging, either MRI or CT, then it becomes very easy. There are now uh, volumetric ways. In fact, you can do it very objectively also. Our uh, radiologists will tell us exactly. The reason they have developed expertise in this is the liver transplant coming in they can exactly calculate the volume of liver that is functioning and so on. We can get very accurate calculations. There's no problem. Any opinion from Dr. Sandeep and uh, Sarma? 
about yeah, you you are radiology able to assess volumetric and uh, I mean the assessment of the liver. We don't do reduction D. We don't do volumetry, but we, if we see a good dilated ducts in the lobes, if we okay. see that the ducts are nicely dilated in both the lobes, we hope that this this portion is. Uh, can be drained very well. If there are uh, irregular thin ducts, we, we presume that this lobe is atrophied. So uh, volumetry assessment is ideal, but we can assess otherwise clinically also. Okay. Uh, Sandeep, what is your take? Yeah, actually on CT or MR, you can easily actually have the assessment of the volume. It is very important because at times, you know, you have a dilated duct, but the atrophic uh, lobe is there. So. Apart from dilated duct, you should have the volume of the parenchyma of the liver, which is important to drain, at least 50%. Okay, the question to you, I will just want to clarify from you is, uh, rather will have your opinion. Uh, do you do liver transplantation in your unit? Or, yeah? so, presently, we are not doing, but um, uh, there, are many, uh, uh, uh. there are many centers in Jaipur who have started it. And uh, okay. there are few which have been done in Jaipur also. Uh, in SMS. Do you think managing post liver transplant biliary stricture is different from other strictures? So, you uh, just can you highlight on for the sake of the audience? Yeah, actually, uh, it's a very important uh, biliary complication post transplant uh, post transplant patients. It occurs to the tune of around five to fifteen percent in uh, deceased donor, and it is it gets doubled up in a, a live donor to twenty eight to thirty two percent. And uh, it is important because uh, we have uh, two different type of strictures. One is uh, an osmotic stricture, uh, which uh, happens when you do a, a biliary uh, anosmosis, and the other one is a non-anosmotic stricture. The anosmotic strictures they appear early; it may appear in days to uh, up to six months. And the late uh, anosmotic strictures, uh, non-anosmotic strictures, they appear late, up to three to six months. And uh, the non-anosmotic strictures are because of the ischemia and uh, uh, some um, uh, immune pathology also. And uh, anosmotic strictures, they occur because of uh, some technical issues which happen during surgery. And uh, the incidence of uh, anosmotic strictures is to the tune of 13%, uh, which is a little more high, 19% in uh, live donor and 12% in deceased donor. And uh, uh, the difference between the two is like, the uh, anosmotic strictures are short, uh, they are single, they are focal, and uh, uh, non-anosmotic, they are ischemic, so they are proximal, they are multiple, and they are longitudinal also, they are long. And uh, MRCP, of course, is the, as, as has been discussed, is the uh, modality of choice for uh, evaluating these strictures. And uh, ERCP, nowadays, uh, in this era, is the treatment of choice, and it is very effective up to 90%. In patients who have got an osmotic sisters in deceased donor, and it comes to a little down around 60 70 percent in patients with an osmotic sisters in the live donor. But if you have actually non anosmotic sisters uh, in deceased donor, uh, it, it is around 50 to 60 percent, but the uh, it still is lower so around 25 percent. How it is different management part of this? You see, the management is very much different. Uh, a single small sticture. Endoscopic treatment is the choice. And mm -hmm. in patients who have got multiple uh, long strictures, especially what happens in post uh, uh, liver transplant, the proximal ducts don't get dilated. So it's very difficult to actually dilate these proximal strictures. And uh, the recurrence rate is more, the rejection of the organ is more, and they may need a retransplant, especially in patients who have got a ischemic stricture. So both of them, effectivity wise, also it is different. And uh, they may require actually other modalities like percutaneous transhepatic approach uh, uh, for dealing if the ERCP fails or if, the, if there is an altered anatomy. Uh, and ultimately, surgery may be required in these difficult strictures. We found technically a little demanding because the after surgery, post op the additions, other things, and the cadaver transplantation, the stricture is on the lawyer side, and the, uh, the live related one, the stricture is on the proximal side. So, and technically a little more demanding, and you have to be very, very careful not to introduce infection because it's the post-operative period. So, these are the things you uh, we need to take uh, into account. in general, yeah. for uh, uh, for post-transplant strictures, multiple plastic stents are better. 
There are, however, in very refractive structures, two types of self-expanding metal stents. One is called the moon stent, and the other is called the cafe okay. stent. Okay. They are very specialized, used only for this type of situation. Uh, although, if you have a patient with a living-related transplant, I think uh, you have to be a little more careful because those strictures are more complex. And these strictures require some skill, and sometimes we have to use a spyglass to scanlate the strictures selectively to go in. Otherwise, the guide wire doesn't go in very easily. Nagi, you said in proximal biliary benign stricture, you will place plastic stent. Yes, plastic stent. How about putting like a cafe stent or something like that? No, no. We found in cafe, you can use rarely those who are resistant, but generally proximal strictures, plastic is better because plastic stents have also got a massage effect there. They're continuously moving in that and they, they keep the stricture open much more. Uh, than a metal. The problem with the metal stent in proximal strictures is that you can't put it equally, equidistance in the center. So either the proximal part is just, just little above the stent. So the migration is extremely high with this and the effectiveness of stent dilatation is not so good. So the general easy rule to remember for everybody is for benign strictures, proximal plastic, distal, completely covered stent. Metal completely. Stent. I think in this, uh, we had a fantastic uh, speaker, an excellent panelist, we discussed uh, from the benign to malignant structure, what is the role of spyglass and what is the role of extracellular vesicle and what is the role of face technique and the kind of type of stent you need to know, a uh, single stent, double stent, all these things are very important. And we just saw a rare case of ampullary, the IgG4 uh, lesion can present like almost like a bulky ampulla and all these things, uh, this is the highlights of this uh, this, uh, this session on uh, biliary stricture. I must thank you for the time allotted. We already exceeded five minutes. And I must thank you, Nagi, for your wonderful uh, the, the talk. And panelists, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Manish, Dr. Amir, and Dr. Sandeep, we had already highlighted which imaging to be done, what are the efforts to take it to sensitivity to the tune of 90%, specific to the tune of 100%, and uh, don't hang on with the brain belief structure. There was a clear cut case of uh, surgery and in uh, cholangiocarcinoma, mostly inoperable. So kind of selection of stent to single to double and the liver transplanters in uh, the strictures, how to manage it effectively. So with this, I conclude this session. Once again, thanking Anil and his team Thank you. for Gangaram Hospital and my panelists and speaker for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. All, all of you would agree that we had a wonderful journey from Earth to Moon. And I'm sure nobody would have taken it better than Professor Nageshwar Reddy. And we had a live commentary by the celebrated flamboyant Dr. Chandrasekhar. I'm also thankful to all the panelists who are uh, giving their important, useful, practical tips on management of common but difficult problem of uh, CBD stricture. With that, we come to the formal end of this session.